So we've been going through worldviews, different religions, different philosophies, different worldviews altogether. I mean, we're, we've gone alphabetically, you know, Buddhism and divination and Freemasonry and so on and so forth. And today we come to Islam. So we're going to compare and contrast Christianity and Islam. There's an outline in your bulletin. You can follow along with this. You, you may or may not know that we post our worship service online. You can always find it on YouTube. If you type in Life Christian Church, there will be two, like a huge Life Christian Church, like with a thousand videos. And then there's us, Life Christian Church. We only have a few hundred videos. And we were really surprised to find out that last Sunday, June 12th, I preached on Hinduism and humanism. We had the highest amount of views ever. 316 is like, where did that come from? Usually we have like 80. We're excited that it happened. We don't know why it happened. We, we hope it keeps happening again. And people that view our service online are able to make a comment. And someone made a comment, and I think I want to lead with that today. I want to read this comment because it is representative of a lot of thinking out there. Again, I preach on Hinduism and secular humanism. And here's what the comment said, and then I'll comment on the comment, okay? What, what does it matter what a Hindu person believes? People believe at all different things. Even Christians believe all different things. Well, they believe different things about kind of non-essentials, right? But most of us believe the same thing about Christ and salvation. By pitting one religious view versus another is pretty divisive, isn't it? Why not just teach whatever it is you think your audience needs to hear about your own beliefs? Is there an arrogance in thinking you know more than other people regarding something that really no one knows anyway? My story is better than yours. How shallow. Now I said I would give a comment or two about that comment, so I'm going to do that right now. So there are Hindus that are starving to death and on their property in India, there are cows, but they will not kill the cow because they think it might be a reincarnated, reincarnated aunt or uncle or, or relative. That cow could provide the milk and the cheese and the hamburger and the steak to keep them alive, but they'll die of starvation. So I guess it is important what Hindus really believe, isn't it? And then there were two Canadian ladies that were both pregnant. They were both Jehovah's Witnesses. And Jehovah's Witnesses say God says do not take a blood transfusion. Both of these ladies gave birth. They needed a blood transfusion. Both of them refused the transfusion. Both of them died, leaving their husbands widowers and the rest of their children motherless. I guess it does matter what a Jehovah's Witness believes. And on September 11, 2001... Arabian uh, hijackers drove planes into buildings killing 2,996 people. They did it because they believed that their God, Allah, wanted non-Muslims to be dead and killed. In fact, there are recordings right before impact that were praising Allah. I guess it does matter what Muslims believe. Right now, <clears throat> the irony of assuming that I'm being divisive, and by the way, I said from the beginning of the series in Second Corinthians ten five that we are to tear down strongholds that come against the true knowledge of God. I my job as a pastor is to show you the false thinking of other religions. That is my job. That's what God has called me to do. And it's not a matter of my religion is better than yours. If you believe 2 plus 2 equals 5, and I believe 2 plus 2 equals 4, it's not that my math is better than your math. It's that my math is true. It's objectively true. You see, Islam and Christianity flatly contradict each other. Both cannot be true. Just logically, they both cannot be true. If you place your faith in an object, you better make sure that that object is solid. You can sincerely believe with all of your heart that Highway 190 is going to take you to the beach. 
But you're going to be rudely awakened when you find out that Highway 190 took you right to Death Valley. You can be so sure you're on a road, but again, our faith is only as strong as the object we place our faith into. And there's a lot of people sincerely believing religions, but they are on a wrong road. And by the way, to say nobody can know the truth anyway, that is called uh, subjectivism. In our world today, a lot of people do not think that there is uh, truth, objective truth. It's whatever is true for me is what is true. But the Bible teaches there is objective truth. We can know the truth. Well, where are the Muslim people living? Islam makes up 20%. Muslims make up 20% of the world population. There's more than a billion Muslims in the world. Non-Arab Muslims outnumber Arab Muslims by a 3 to 1 ratio. There are 52 countries dominated by Islam. Indonesia has more Muslims than any country, 154 million. The Arab world has 140 million. Bangladesh, 90 million Muslims. Pakistan, 90 million. India, 70 million Muslims. China, 63 million Muslims. Turkey, 46 million. England, 1.5 million. There are 1,500 mosques in England. Many of them in London. There are more mosques in London than churches that are in London. There are 100,000 international students that are Muslim in the United States. There are 3.5 million Muslims in the United States of America. The states that have the heaviest Muslim population are Illinois, Virginia, New York, and New Jersey. The state with the lowest amount of Muslims is Montana. Montana. And in California, there are 732 Muslims for every 100,000 people. So we are surrounded by Muslims here in Southern California and in our country. Now, there are two branches of Islam. Uh, They are the Sunnis and the Shiites. They originally divided over who would be Muhammad's successor. The Sunnis believe the caliph or successor should be elected, whereas the Shiites believe that Muhammad's cousin Ali should be the leader. The Sunnis believe in written traditions and customs. They are authoritative, including the Hadith, which was a book written about 150 years after Muhammad died that fills in a lot of blanks, some other teachings that are not found in the Quran, etc. But the Shiites uh, believe that the Quran is authoritative, not customs. The religious leaders are political leaders. There's no separation of church and state. It's like Iran, like Ayatollah Khomeini. They, whoever the leader is, they are the leader of the church. They are the leader of the country, one and the same. So let's start off and follow in your outline. Let's look at some of the differences here. Let's look. First of all, let's just start with God. The God of Islam is called Allah. The God of the Bible is called Yahweh, which means I am. And Allah is not Yahweh. They are two different gods uh, altogether. And Allah is a, is a singular God. Uh, in fact, the un- unforgivable sin in Islam is to associate a partner with God, with Allah. There is no equal to Allah. So you can't have anybody equal with him sharing glory. Interesting to note, Jesus said in John 17, 5, not in your outline, but in the Bible. Jesus prayed in John 17, 5, glorify me together with thyself, Father, with the glory that I had with you before the world was. So God the Father has shared his glory with God the Son. That would be the unforgivable sin in Islam, that Allah will not share his glory with anybody else. You see, we believe that God is triunity, three in one. In Matthew 28, 19, in the baptism formula, it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. One name, three people. One name, three people. And here's a couple of quotes from the Quran. And the Quran has, in the book, the Quran is the holy book of Islam. There are 114 chapters called surahs. And here's a couple of quotes from them. God forbid that he himself should beget a son. Well, they're kind of thinking physically and sexually, but they're saying that God would never have a son. 
Is there another one? Then God will say, Jesus, son of Mary, did you ever say to mankind, worship me and my mother as God's beside, as God's beside God? You know, Muhammad had a misconception about the Trinity. He thought the Christian Trinity was God, Jesus, and Mary. Worship me and my mother as God beside God. Glory to you, he will answer. How could I ever say that which I have no right? So this was the in the 7th century, right, A.D., where Mariolatry, the idolization of Mary, was lifted up pretty high. So that colored his understanding uh, of the Trinity. You know, it does say in Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Lord thy God is one God. So as Christians, we believe in one God, not in three gods. You see, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, there is a one what and three who's. One what and three who's. There's one God and three people that claim to be God within the Trinity. Now, it's interesting that in Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Lord that God is one God. It's the Hebrew word akkad. The word one means compound unity. There's a couple words for one in the Hebrew. But this is compound unity. The Lord that God is one. You know, in Genesis 2, speaking of Adam and Eve, the two shall become one flesh. Again, the one is a compound unity. And in Exodus 24, 3, it talks about they cried out with one voice. Exodus 24, 3. Do we have that in the PowerPoint today? There it is. Moses came and reported to the people all the words of the Lord and the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice. All the people answered with how many voices? One. It's a compound unity. Those were thousands of voices, not just one voice, but that word is meant to use a compound unity. And do you know the word Elohim, which is translated God in the Old Testament, is actually a plural word, meaning God's? You know, let us make man in our image. Who's talking there? Well, that's God talking. Who's our? Well, it's God and Christ. Let us make him in our image. So our God, and it's, a lot of people misunderstand the Trinity, not just Muslims, Jehovah's Witness, everybody else. We believe that God is three in one. And two of the most common elements on planet Earth can also be three in one. Have you seen the unity candle at a wedding? There are two outside candles, and they representing the husband and wife, and they light an inner unity candle. And at that moment, when the two outside candles are lighting the inside candle, how many flames are actually there? There's three. There's the two outside ones and the new one that they've lit. Fire can be three in one. Also, water can be three in one. Have you heard of the triple point? You cool down water to a point where it's water, steam, and ice all at the same time. So three in one is something that we can understand just in our world today. Now let's look at a second uh, difference here. Allah is not a father. There are 99 names of Allah. And maybe you've seen Muslims look like they have rosary beads. That's, it's not rosary beads. They're going over 99 different names of Allah, one bead for each name of Allah. But one of those names, one of those 99 names is not Father. He's never called Father. Of course, um, in the Bible, we do have a Heavenly Father. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. So obviously, if there's a Son, there's a Father. In John 5.18, Jesus said these words, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus was saying, God is my Father. And interesting to note, point three, Allah doesn't love sinners. Allah doesn't love sinners. I'm going to read some from the Koran here. Uh, this is from Surah 6, 142. But you shall not be prodigal. Allah does not love the prodigals. Interesting. Jesus does. God does. We have a whole parable called the prodigal son. He was lost and then he was found. In Surah 3, 140, God does not love evildoers. In Surah 4, 107, God does not love the treacherous or the sinful. In Surah 731, Don't drink to excess. God does not love the intemperate. 
Well, we find all over the Bible that God does love sinners. Romans 5, 8. How about that one? God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God does love sinners, the drunkards, the immoral people, the you name it, God loves you. And in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And Paul was a murderer, an associate of murder, and he says, God loved me. So the God of the Bible does love sinners, but Allah does not love sinners. And then... In the Quran and Islam, some are predestined to hell. I will say there are some Christians who believe this as well. But in Surah 7, 178, the man whom God guides is rightly guided, but those who he confounds will surely be the losers. We have predestined to hell many jinn, which is their understanding of angels, and many men. They are like beasts. So in Islam, people are predestined to go to hell. But in the New Testament, everybody can be saved. Second Peter 3, 9. God is not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's God's will, that everybody's going to repent. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 3. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants everybody to be saved. God wants uh, everybody to be redeemed. Uh, not so in Islam. Now a fifth point is that Muhammad... Sinned. He is a sinner, and in Surah 40, 55, Muhammad is told to implore forgiveness for your sins. Now, Muhammad was born in 570 A.D. He's the father of Islam. He died in 632 A.D., and he received revelations in a cave from who he said was the angel Gabriel. And the angel Gabriel gave him all the message that is in the Quran that Jesus is not Lord, Jesus is not the Son of God. Funny, in year zero, the angel Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary and said, Jesus is God, Jesus is the Son of God. But the angel Gabriel supposedly said in seven centuries uh, later that Jesus is not God, Jesus is not the Lord. Did the angel Gabriel change his mind? I don't think so. Do you know what Galatians 1.8 says? But even though we or an angel of God should preach to you a gospel contrary to what you've heard, let that person be what? Accursed. You see, the new revelation will not overturn the old revelation. The new revelation must buttress and agree with the prior revelation. And of course, you have... Islam saying Jesus is not the Son of God. Supposedly from the angel Gabriel. Well, point number five, Jesus is uh, sinless. He who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Jesus never ever sinned. Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ never sinned. He was tempted, but he didn't enter into the temptation. You know, it's interesting to note that there is no burden bearing in Islam. It says twice that no soul can bear another's burdens. In Islam, your burden of sin, you are stuck with it. Nobody else can bear your burden. But of course, in the New Testament, Jesus bore our sins. First Peter 2.24, he himself brought our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. He bore our sins on his body. Now, most of us know the story in Genesis 22 where Abraham was commanded to kill his son, sacrifice his son Isaac. You know, the Muslims have a different spin on that. They say that Abraham was told to sacrifice Ishmael, But where both stories are the same is that a ram, a a male lamb, was caught in a thicket and that animal was sacrificed instead of the kid. So there is, even in the Quran, there is a substitutionary atonement in their understanding of Genesis 2.22. You know, the Jesus in the Quran is very different than the Jesus in the Bible. The Quran mentions Jesus about 50 times. So Jesus is definitely in the Quran, but he's always called a prophet, never the son of God. The Quran teaches that Jesus did miracles as a baby. 
They said he preached from his cradle in Surah 5, 110. They say Jesus actually brought curses upon other children. And they say that Jesus took some clay and breathed into it and became a bird. The Quran teaches that. Of course, the Bible says in John chapter 2 that the first miracle that Jesus Christ ever did was changing water into wine. Well, where did the story come from that Jesus made clay into a bird? It comes from what's called the infancy gospel of Thomas. Infancy gospel of Thomas, which was judged to be fictional by Eusebius, the first Christian historian, and by many sins. Well, another difference, number seven, in Islam, it says Jesus was created. He was created from Surah 359. Jesus is like Adam in the sight of God. He created him out of the dust and and said to him, be, and he was. So they say that God just created Jesus, you know, just be, just exist. Of course, in the Bible, Jesus is God. He's not a created being. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Christ. It just says that Christ was God. You know, there's uh, the differences between the Koran, uh, Jesus in the Koran and Jesus in the Bible are huge, and here's probably the most noteworthy one. Number eight, the Koran says Jesus was not, not crucified. And here is Surah 457. They denied the truth and uttered a monstrous falsehood against Mary. They declared, we have put to death the Messiah, Jesus the son of Mary, the apostle of God. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but they thought they did. Literally, he was made to resemble another for them. Those that disagreed about him were in doubt concerning him. They knew nothing about him. That he was not, that was not sheer conjecture. They did not slay him for certain. God lifted him, him up to him. So the Muslims believe that at the cross there was like a mist and a fog that came over the cross. And then it wasn't Jesus on the cross. Somebody else was substituted in. Some believe Judas, which is nonsensical because Jesus, uh, uh, Judas, sorry, had already committed suicide. So they don't believe that the crucifixion ever happened and that God just kind of raptured Jesus up into the sky. There was never any resurrection because he was never really crucified. Jesus Christ never really died. Of course, the eyewitnesses who saw it and wrote books of the Bible, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, Paul, James, and Jude, they said that the crucifixion happened. And there are two first century historians that said the crucifixion did happen. And you've heard those names mentioned from this pulpit before. Cornelius Tacitus was a Roman senator and historian who recorded that Jesus Christ was crucified under Pontius Pilate. And Josephus, a Jewish historian, not a Christian, also in Antiquities 18.3, said that Jesus Christ was crucified under Pontius Pilate. The reference to Tacitus is Annals 1544. He said Christ was crucified under Pontius Pilate. So Islam is anti-historical because two historians beside the Bible said he was crucified. So how do we know if he was crucified or not? Or not? Because two historians agree with the New Testament account. That settles the score. And it should for everybody. It's a very important difference. Another important difference in Islam, you are saved by works. Let me just quote uh, from John 10, 17. Christ said these words about his crucifixion. Let's go backward a slide. He said, I lay down my own life. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own. Do you remember the time where Christ said, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified? And Peter at one point said, no, God forbid, Lord, this should never happen to you. And what did Jesus say to him? Get behind me. It is a satanic idea that Jesus Christ was not crucified. A satanic idea. Well, the Muslims believe you are saved by your works. In Islam, they teach that every person has two angels assigned to them. 
One is on their right shoulder recording every good thing you ever did in your life. Another angel is sitting on your left shoulder writing down every bad thing and sin you ever did. Now there's also five pillars of Islam that every Muslim is supposed to obey. To recite the creed, there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. They're to repeat that all the time. They're to pray five times toward Mecca every day. Maybe you've heard that siren go off before the sun comes up. I would hate to live in a country like that and have my sleep interrupted by that. But they have to pray five times a day facing Mecca. Number three, they have to give uh, 2.5% of their income for the poor almsgiving. Number four, they have to observe Ramadan, which is a holy month of prayer and fasting. Uh, it switches every year, but they're not allowed to eat or drink at all during the daylight hours. It's been kind of proven that Muslims eat more during Ramadan than any other month of the year because once the sun goes down, they have this massive party. And then the fifth thing they have to do is a pilgrimage to Mecca sometime in their life. They will give you an exemption if you have a medical problem or whatever. Uh, listen to these words on being saved by works from Surah 7, 8 and 9. On that day, all shall be weighed with justice. Those whose scales are heavy with their bad deeds, shall um, with the good deeds, shall triumph. But those whose scales are light shall lose their souls. So if you do more good things than bad things, you're going to be saved. Well, what does Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 say? I think you know it. How about the woman caught in, uh, that was at the party, the immoral woman in Luke 7, 50? She was told by Christ, your faith has saved you, not your works has saved you. We are saved by faith. And she is told to go in peace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace is undeserved kindness. We're not saved by our works. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not as a result of work so that no one can boast. If you can go up to heaven and, and make it and say, well, I'm here because I did more good things than bad things. That would be boasting about your life. And then, but the only boast we're going to have in heaven is that we are a child of God, that Christ died for our sins. I hope you all understand the difference that almost every religion we've studied so far is salvation by your works. It's by what you D-O, not by what Christ is D-O-N-E, not by what he has done. Well then, uh, lastly, or almost lastly, is polygamy, the Koran allows Muslim men to take four wives. In Surah 4, 3, it says that. And Muhammad actually had 22 women in his life. This is all from the Hadith. Remember that document written 100 years after he died? And two of those women or wives are very problematic. There was a certain wife called Zainab who was originally married to Muhammad's uh, son, adopted son, Zaid. And Muhammad was struck with Zainab's beauty. And so Zed decided to divorce her and give his wife to his adopted father. And then in Surah 33, it kind of blesses this whole thing. It's fine in the sight of Allah. And then there's another big problem. Aisha was six years old when she was pledged to Muhammad as, uh, as a wife. Muhammad was in his mid-50s at the time. And in the Hadith, volume 5, page 153, it states that that marriage was consummated when that child was nine years old by Muhammad. You would be thrown in jail, in prison, if that happened in America and should happen anywhere over the world. That's called child molestation. You know, the biblical standard is not polygamy. In Deuteronomy 17, it says the kings are not to multiply wives for himself. And the New Testament standard for marriage in 1 Timothy 3, 2, for a pastor or elder, is the husband of one wife. So since the time of Christ, the standard is one wife, monogamy. Our standard is not King David. Our standard is not Solomon. Our standard is not Abraham or anybody else who had more than one wife in the Bible. Our standard is 1 Timothy 3, 2, husband of one wife. And something you might know already is that women are inferior in Islam. Now here's a quote from the Quran that 
maybe might stun you a little bit, but here it is. Men have authority over women because God has made the one superior to the other. And because they spend, spend their wealth to maintain them, good women are obedient. They guard their unseen parts because God has guarded them. And for those whom you fear disobedience, admonish them and send them to their beds and beat them. Then if they obey, you take no further action against them. So the Quran condones wife beating. I remember I was up in Seattle. I did a home call on a visitor and she told me she was engaged to a Muslim man. I said, you need to know what you're getting into. And I read her this quote from the Quran right there. And you know what? She changed her mind. She changed her mind because she didn't want to be in a marriage to a Muslim man that believes this from their holy book. Now, in Christianity, there is equality among the sexes, Galatians 3.28. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one. In Christ Jesus. The women have been liberated by Jesus Christ. Men are not superior to women in Christianity as is in Islam. Well, finally, there is holy war. It's called jihad in the Quran. You know, Muhammad was a violent man. Historically, it's proven. He would rob caravans. He conquered Mecca with the sword. He would administer assassinations and executions. Many of them are established in the Hadith. It doesn't even deny it. Muhammad was involved in 66 battles that are all recorded in the Quran. Now, the only way a Muslim has assurance of salvation is if they die in holy war, if they die in jihad. Now, I'm going to read a couple quotes from the Quran uh, in Surah 3, 195, if you fight, I shall forgive their sin, they shall be forgiven of their sins and admit them to gardens watered by running streams as a reward from God. And from Surah um, 495, fight for the cause of God, for those who fight for the cause of God will be given a higher rank than those who stay home. God has promised a good reward, but far richer is the recompense of those who fight for him. They will get forgiveness and mercy. So the only way a Muslim will know for certain if he's going to go to paradise, if he dies in holy war. And that is why on 9-11, the people flying the planes were really sure they were going to heaven because their holy book says they're going to. They were promised paradise, assurance of salvation. Now, folks, we have assurance of salvation as believers in Christ. These things I write to you believe in the name of the Son of God and that you may know that you have eternal life. We have assurance not because we're going to die in holy war. We have assurance we're going to heaven because we believe in Jesus Christ. That's where our assurance comes from. And, of course, Christianity is to be nonviolent. Matthew 26, 52, put your sword back in its place. Remember when Peter took out the sword at the arrest? For all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. John 18, 36, before Pontius Pilate, he said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Christianity is not into military fighting to take to advance the kingdom of God. But Islam is. You see, it really is important... What we, what our religion believes, isn't it? It affects so many aspects of our life. I don't know where you are today. I, I, I have shared the gospel with Muslim friends of mine and acquaintances, is Uber drivers, you know, whoever it is. We need to be able to not shy away from Muslim people. We need to engage them in conversation. We need to be able to tell them the truth. We need to ask them some really hard questions about the Quran and about their beliefs. And the best news is this, we are not saved by our deeds. Can you imagine if 
Shane Womack, all my bad deeds were recorded and uh, they were brought before God and I'm hoping that I'm going to get into heaven because I've had more good deeds than bad deeds. That ain't going to happen. That ain't going to happen. Because you know what has a, a heavier scale? My bad deeds have a heavier scale than my good deeds. Maybe you're here today and you've never officially received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. God loved you so much he went to the cross all the way for you. Never wonder whether God loves you or not. It is a fact in the Bible. And you can know it. And he can come into your heart today if you just invite him. So let's all bow our heads for a second. If you're here today and that is your will, you want to surrender your life to Christ. And by the way, the word Islam means submission. Submission. It's submission to Allah. It's submission to Muhammad. But we submit our hearts to the one who went all the way to the cross to bear our burden of sin. So let's bow our heads for a moment. If you're here today and you want to make that commitment to Christ, um, say these words silently. I'll say them aloud for you. God will hear you. Lord, thank you that you're the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through you. Thank you, Lord, that you love sinners. Thank you, Lord, that you, uh, you saved us by your grace and by your mercy. And it's not up to us, but it is up to us to receive you or not. So if you're here today and you want to receive Christ, say these words, God, today I receive you into my heart. I receive Jesus Christ in my heart as my personal Lord and Savior. I know he paid the penalty for my sin. And I'm asking that you would be Lord of my life. May your Holy Spirit come in. I know I'm a sinner, but I want to re repent and get off that path and get on your path right now. In Jesus' name, amen.